What's going on YouTube? It is Pete coming in hot with another video, also known as that guy Pete. You just refuse to invite to gatherings. And today we are here to do another book review of sorts. And the name of the book that I'm going to go over today is The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century. So it was written by um, British author Louise Perry. The focus of the book is exactly as it sounds. Unlike the previous book that I reviewed, which was about lifting the wrapping off the manosphere, which obviously, you know, had a bone to pick with the, um, the biology and the, the genetics and stuff like that, on which, you know, inductive reasoning was used to reach conclusions that the author disagreed with and so on and so forth. From the manosphere angle this book specifically targets feminism um, in regards to the sexual liberation uh, movement and i think deep down a lot of men um, they don't really have too much of an issue with you know economic rights political rights and things like this it's more when you blatantly ignore the biological and social differences between men and women and pretend that they don't exist and then try to build a oofy doofy utopia around that, that um, some gears get grinded. And this author in particular has a bit of an ax to grind um, in regards to the sexual revolution. How good is it really? Um, and are the costs too high? Okay. This book in particular is geared primarily towards women to kind of get them to rethink what it is exactly that they've consented to when it comes to the sexual liberation uh, movement, what type of ideology they've agreed to exactly, do they fully understand the gravity of what they agree to, and ultimately what they can do to sort of counteract the negatives of this and live in a way that is much more conducive to their own goals in terms of intersex relations and ultimately what they want. Um, while I think for men this is still an interesting read and she does welcome men uh, to read the book, um, she definitely does talk about a lot of things that the Manosphere talks about, for sure. Um, you know, she does mention David Buss a few times, and I know some of the evolutionary psychology people um, in the space are very well aware of who that man is. He's basically the father of evolutionary psychology. Still a field in its infancy, but still some interesting insights nevertheless. Um, very much like the other author, uh, this author does have her sources. I'm going to try in a similar format to put the bibliography in the description. I'll try to do it again so that you can check out her studies yourself, draw your own conclusions, and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, I'm interested in truth. I'm not interested in making a bunch of information a fundamental part of my identity. I always say this, which means I'm always looking for the answers and I'm always looking for a realistic picture of what the entire world um, is, not just the internet. Okay? So, with that opening concluded, here's what we're going to do we're going to talk about the author herself. Not much to say there. We're going to go through the eight chapters in the book and the various ideas of each one. Um, and I got my notes in front of me in my little handy dandy notebook, just like I did last time. And after we go through all those chapters, we're going to conclude just by some closing pieces of advice that she has for women. Um, and I thought that these were very, very good points. And therefore, I'm going to relay them to you in the event that you do not wish to read the book for whatever reason, if you're afraid that, um, you know, this book is going to shatter your perception of the world, or if you just don't have an interest in reading the book, or some other reason that prevents you from reading it, I'm going to give it to you. But I definitely look at this book, and I think this is as close to the female version of, like, the rational male. So I say that in the sense that it's the book that could get a woman to start thinking down this line, very similarly to how a lot of uh, manosphere people think. 
in the sense that she might actually start looking at like, okay, it's not about feels, feels. Let's actually start thinking about what's best for me and my goals and kind of go towards that. What do I really want? Not what I've agreed to want per the feminist narrative. What do I really want out of intersex relations? So I think this is a very good book for women. I, I encourage them to read it. Um, but yes, um, all I mean by the fact that it's kind of the female counterpoint to the rational male is that it's just a good starting point for women, I think, to kind of break into the conversation and get a feel for what we're talking about. Um, that being said, if you saw my review of The Irrational Male, um, that book kind of highlights where the rational male in particular kind of can be a bit problematic in terms of how it gathers its information and stuff like that. So you're welcome to go take a look at that video if you want. But I just wanted to draw the parallel in the sense that that's kind of like the entry point. And I think this book could be the female counterpart to entry point because it's got a lot of good ideas in it and it makes a lot of excellent points. Okay. So without further ado, let's go ahead and commence by talking about the author. So Louise Perry, who is she? Well, she's a writer and campaigner and she's based in London. She's a columnist at the New Statesman and also writes for the Daily Mail. She writes like feature articles from time to time for the Daily Mail. She's a press officer of the group We Can't Consent to This. More on what that is later. And she's a huge supporter of marriage. Um, based on what I could gather about her personal life, she appears to be in her 30s. She has kids. Um, but I couldn't find any info on her marital status. I'm assuming given her strong belief in marriage, she is married. Um, and she also worked at a crisis center for victims of R word. So that's a very unique experience that probably got helped her see the, the downside to um, the sexual liberation movement, the dark side, the dark underbelly that nobody wants you to see, right? You get to see it up close firsthand. So first what we're going to do is we're going to begin with chapter one here, which she titles the idea that sex must be taken seriously as a concept. Um, and she breaks it down to three subsections, discontents of sexual liberalism, sexual disenchantment, and chronological snobbery. All right. So this one in particular is probably not going to take a lot of time to explain, but I've got my notes in front of me. So just like last time, I'm going to read them and I'm going to comment as we go. So she begins the book by comparing Hugh Hefner. For those of you who don't know, Hugh Hefner, um, lives, lived in the Playboy Mansion, responsible for the Playboy magazine, all that fun stuff. Um, she talks about Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe and how in reality, sexual liberation benefits the likes of Hugh Hefner, not Marilyn Monroe. And basically, when you kind of look at how their lives ended, Hefner made money off of her image while she ultimately died alone. So yes, on paper, you know, she did these photo shoots um, they told her certain things about what they were going to do with the photos, but what they ended up doing with the photos was very different from what they told her they were going to do with the photos. And she basically said, like, I had to go and um, I had to go and find my own pictures in the Playboy magazine and, and see what it was all about. And obviously, she didn't like what they did with the photos. Um, and that being said, um, in the public eye, she kind of had a reputation for being very promiscuous. Um, she had a reputation. Um, for substance use and things like this and ultimately she died very young and alone and it's been rumored that she had a lot of um, back alley baby egg and cheeses which basically destroyed her reproductive organs so her life isn't as glamorous as um, some proponents of the sexual revolution make it out to be and I think she wanted to kind of draw this contrast that really it wasn't Marilyn Monroe that was winning in this scenario it was the likes of Hugh Hefner which we talk about in the Mansphere from time to time, right? When women go out and they embrace this liberated, prom promiscuous lifestyle, it's not them that's winning. It's the it's all the men that are having 80% of the sex. They're the ones that are winning, <laughs> right? They're winning, not these women, because these a lot of these women who think they're liberated and free, they're not really getting what they want out of intersex relations. And that's kind of how she kicks things off. Now, when she talks about discontents of sexual liberalism, she in particular takes issue with the liberal narrative of things like porn, BDSM, which if you don't know what that is, it's uh, bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism, 
hookup culture, prostitution, and so on. Um, and her experience at the R Word Crisis Center, it changed her perspective. So she saw the ugly side of sexual liberation and how, for women, it's kind of shit. It's not as great as, as you know, people make it out to be. Sure, you have freedom to do anything you want. And, you know, at the same time, though, there's strings attached when you're going out and being reckless sexually. And sadly, many women learned this the hard way. And they ended up at this center. So, yes... Obviously, freedom is definitely a value. Liberty is a value that we should have as a society. But we can't lose sight of other values that we have as well, such as self-control, restraint, conservatism, for lack of a better term. So, out of the gate, you can see that she was pretty critical of the current feminist narrative that sexual liberation is somehow this empowering thing that's all good, no collateral damage, nothing bad happens, and so on and so forth. But you're probably wondering, okay, she has this term here called sexual disenchantment. What does that mean? So sexual disenchantment is the idea that sex is just a leisure activity and only has meaning if the people engaged in it give it meaning. There is no intrinsic specialness about the act that separates it from other types of acts, such as eating, um, playing video games or something like this. Therefore, it can be commodified without issue. In other words, it's just sex. Now, obviously, pre-sexual revolution, it wasn't just sex. We've talked about this all the time. For a man, commitment is his emotional investment. For a woman, sex is her emotional investment. So obviously, women care about sex, and it means a lot more to women in the abstract, but when a man is committed, sex means just as much to him. So when you look at this attitude that we have where people just look at sex like, oh, you know, it's just sex. Is it any wonder that we have these overly sexually charged advertisements all over the place? It's everywhere and anywhere that you look. It's in the schools. It's on the social media. Hell, it's probably even in your YouTube ads, right? It's everywhere. And the attitude, the way she encapsulates it, the way she refers to it, is sexual disenchantment. Sex isn't this special thing anymore. We're disenchanted with it. It's not a big deal. And when you look at sex like it's not a big deal, generally the things that follow after that can also be viewed as not a big deal. Which, of course, can be problematic if the places where that line of thought leads you are harmful which we'll talk more about later. So that's what she means when she says sexual disenchantment in this book. And the last term she talks about in the first chapter is chronological snobbery. So what the hell is this? Well, the idea that 21st century folks view older people as foolish, uninteresting, and problematic in worst case scenarios. You ever look online? Okay, boomer, whatever you say, boomer, that kind of shit. That's what we're talking about here. That basically the wisdom of the people who came before us, it's uh, nothing more than just oppressive patriarchal garbage. And thus, they are viewed as unwise. They do not receive any respect, and they are condescended to by charlatans who believe they know what's what, despite having lived on this earth for a significantly shorter time. Chronological snobbery. The older generations, they're completely out of touch. They, they don't know what's best. They don't know what role sex should play in modern society. They have no idea what they're talking about. Yet they have a whole ex lifetime of experience that a lot of these younger folks have yet to have. So that's what we mean by chronological snobbery. You're speaking from a place of arrogance. You're speaking from a place where you have this, again, charlatan-type mindset where you believe you have this special knowledge that makes you inherently superior to your older peers, right? Articles being written by people on how to deal with your family at the Thanksgiving table, like you know what's best for the world. This isn't uncommon, and social media has made it easier than ever for these types of um, blurbs and pieces of advice to propagate and spread all over the place. All right, and that's pretty much what we're talking about when we talk about 
chronological snobbery. And pretty much sexual, excuse me, pretty much when it comes to the sexual liberation movement and the arguments that are put forth behind it, the author pretty much wants to say that these arguments, two cornerstones of it, are sexual disenchantment and chronological snobbery. The arguments basically ooze these two things from start to finish. But she's going to dive in more throughout the book on why she thinks they're kind of like this um, and ultimately why she disagrees with them. So let's continue now with pretty obvious one in case it wasn't obvious uh, men and women are different <laughs> and she breaks this up into four sections human animals above the neck our word as adaptation and basically accepting differences between men and women okay so one of the first things that she mentions right out of the gate is socialization that is the way we raise boys and the way we raise girls it's different so even if hypothetically right the genetic series of on switches and off switches in both a boy and a girl in 2022 that pops out would be identical. Let's say they're t fraternal twins, right? Let's say it's the same. The point is that since epigenetics is the mechanism by which genes express themselves, if you're kind of raising a boy in a different environment and the kind of rules you're setting for him is different than the rules you're setting for the girl, then the way in which those genes manifest will change over time between the boy and the girl. Okay. But it's not just that. Biology is also different too. XX and XY. You can't refute that. Men tend to be stronger. They tend to be faster. So on and so forth. And with these two things at play, the thing that feminism really struggles to grapple with is that our psychology is different. The way men think and the way women think is not the same. The way they communicate is not the same. We talk about this all the time, right? Men tend to think more with their minds. Women tend to think more with their hearts, for lack of better terminology, right? What makes sense versus what feels right? There are outliers, of course, but this seems to be the general observation that we see. But feminism doesn't like it when you suggest that maybe psychologically we're different too, not just physically. They're forced to concede on the physical front because it's fucking right in front of you. But psychologically, you don't see. Okay? But in the context of human animals, it's important to remember, like every other species, we too are animals. Of course, we're mammals. So we're capable of kindness. We're capable of pro-social behavior and parental investment, just like some other species, but we're also capable of horrifying things, such as murder, torture, and, of course, our word. Right? We're no exception to the rule. We are animals. We're part of this animal kingdom, just like anyone else. And I think the reason why she points out the obvious here is because, again, when you have a whole generation of people with this charlatan mindset, again, they think that they are above this type of shit. They're above it. They're better than it. And the truth is, no, you're not. You're not. You're an animal, just like the rest. And there's no shame in just acknowledging that. You're a highly sophisticated animal, but an animal, nevertheless. Okay. So she then goes on to dig into this above-the-neck idea, right? So the first thing she prefaces is that men and women are on average a certain way does not equal men and women are always like this, right? We talk about this in the manosphere all the time as well. We talk about this idea, hey, wait, 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 I have an exception to the rule, so fuck your rule. People do that all the time, but one of the things we say in the manosphere is there are no absolutes. There just aren't, right? Just by definition, look at a distribution. There's tails and there's the meat of the bell curve. Yes, the meat of the bell curve is what you're going to see most of the fucking time, but it doesn't negate the fact that the tails exist, of course. So it was nice to see that she made this, this um, distinction here. Kind of shows that she has her head screwed on straight, and she's looking at it correctly. So I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, but feminism has kept its distance from evolutionary psychology, David Buss and things like this. right? In other words, they're very dismissive 
of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology as fields because they're still in their infancy they're still learning and you know compared to other scientific fields yes there's there's some ground to cover of course but if you never begin the process of covering the ground big shock you never cover the ground so yeah feminism keeps its distance from evolutionary psychology which as we said explores the psychological differences between men and women beyond the physical the obvious stuff even entertaining this idea is considered taboo in feminist circles and is dismissed as a fully pseudoscientific circle jerk, which is pretty much how feminism talks about the manosphere all the time. They say that we're just a bunch of pseudoscientific dudes just engaging in a circle jerk and giving each other confirmation bias, which does happen in some portions of the, of the manosphere, of course. There's no shortage of people that think they know everything there is to know about the world hey, this is my experience, and because this is my experience, this is how everyone is, and I'm going to tell myself that so I can justify whatever decision it is that I have reached. But the point is that feminism does that too. <laughs> Just go look at a female dating strategy Reddit. It's the same fucking shit. But, again, feminism makes little to no contribution to the evolutionary psychology discussion. You won't catch them talking about it because they think it's just like a pointless exercise. And instead of contributing to the discussion, what they do is they fire people like James Damore from Google. So James Damore, for those of you who don't know, he was working in the STEM field in um, at Google. And he said point blank that the reason that women don't work in STEM as much as men do isn't because, you know, women are deliberately being discriminated against to not work in STEM is that it's because men and women are different. <laughs> men and women aren't just physically different, they're psychologically different. So therefore, what makes them tick psychologically is different. That's okay. But the women who are interested in STEM will show up in STEM and they'll work there. But all this guy was saying like, hey, why is this discrepancy here? Here's a possible explanation. And instead of listening to what he had to say, they just fired him. They just fired him. And that should very clearly illustrate the attitude that the feminist movement has towards evolutionary psychology in the context of intersex relations. But it's also no surprise then that the manosphere feels at home filling the vacuum, right? Because again, when you're talking about feminism, right, it tries to cover as many things as it can to make women feel they have a picture and that they don't need to go anywhere else to get any more information. In other words, they're building their own echo chamber. Feminism. The manosphere can be guilty of this as well, building its own echo chamber and closing you off to alternative lines of thought. Either way, it's dangerous. But what we're trying to illustrate for the purposes of this particular section is that because feminism refuses to even go into the realm of evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology, no surprise that sooner or later the men stepped up, went into that, and started talking about this. No surprise that folks like Jordan Peterson and David Buss are talking about this stuff and having conversations. Right? But women, I would say it is in your interest to get educated on evolutionary psychology because it might help you figure out and understand a lot of situations that you've encountered in your life already. Which, of course, you know, would be good. Naturally. Okay? So, that's what we're talking about when we are looking at above the neck. Now, the next thing is our word as an adaptation. So, it's no secret that men and women's interests are in tension with one another. Right? Given the current transactional nature of relationships in 2022, what do we see when we look on the internet? We see pieces of shit, basically. What do I mean? Well, we got women trying to use men. We got them trying to milk as much commitment or the boyfriend experience out of them without giving them sex. And on the other side, we got men trying to get sex out of women without having to give them any of the boyfriend treatment. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is the tension that we have in a modern transactional society. And it's difficult it's difficult to reconcile this reality with a deregulated sexual free-for-all, which is exactly what you're seeing. 
and it's creating some ass backward shit. Now, she goes on to imply that the R word, as a result, is about power, but not just power. Yes, power is a part of it, of course. Um, but cases of R word and peak attractiveness of women, it follows the same trend, which implies that while power can be the motivating factor, it's not always so or just that. Sex also can be a motivator for why this occurs. Tension builds, and again, some men lack impulse control. They're more inclined towards violence, and unfortunately, as a result of that, this shit happens. It does not make it right. It's obviously wrong on moral grounds. However, it explains why we're seeing this, just as we see it in other animal species as well. So building off of that, right? She cites a, a piece of writing from David Buss, the father of evolutionary psychology. And he writes this, right? Men obviously differ in their inclinations towards violence, right? Men tend to be more aggressive than women. This is no secret, right? And Buss mentions that in one study, they asked men that if there was zero chance of getting caught or anyone knowing, etc., cetera, um, would you force the issue of sex, coercive sex, bare minimum, right? And 35% said there would be some likelihood there they would force the issue under these conditions, but the likelihood was slight, which means more likely than not, they probably wouldn't. But there's a slight chance they would. So that, yes, rightfully so, should be alarming. Thankfully, it's not the majority, but it should still be alarming to you. And 27% outright said there'd be some likelihood if they were to not get caught. So three out of 10 almost. So that's pretty dangerous, yes. But as I said, most wouldn't. While 10% have actually admitted to some form of coercion. So if we wanted to be very conservative here, right? We would extrapolate, as the author does, that 10% is a rough ballpark of men to be considered reliably dangerous. Not possibly dangerous, reliably dangerous. So, as a result of this, hashtag not all men, it actually rings true. And we would expect this. Most men are not prone to violence towards women. Most men are prone to protect women. So it makes sense that most men uh, have that instinct to protect. However, because these genes that incline a man towards violence were not sufficiently bad to be filtered out by natural selection, we still unfortunately see remnants of these genes, even today. That being said, you're aware of the difference between male aggressiveness and female aggressiveness, male strength, female strength, male psychological differences compared to female psychological differences, right? So naturally, when you accept these differences, the author makes some suggestions, taking precautions to minimize the risk of these dangers that you're now aware of, logically. Now, of course, the most obvious one would be just to constrain the 10% by imprisonment, right? That would, that would be the logical thing to do. But a more practical thing that's more applicable immediately is to limit opportunities for them to act. Ladies, when you're on nights out, stick together. Don't get shit-faced to the point where you don't know where you are. Make sure you have rides to and from home and stay safe, right? This is just practical advice. Yeah, because at the end of the day, right, this minority of men, men who are aroused by things like violence because something's not right up here or in the genome, they have poor impulse control and they don't care about your safety. They don't have that drive to protect. Wherever that drive to protect is, they ain't got it. <laughs> they have a drive to do the opposite hurt you. So knowing that these men exist and not only knowing that they exist, but knowing that they can hurt you means, hey, maybe going out by yourself and being a sexually liberated party girl who's shit faced out of her skull probably isn't a good idea. If you're going to do go out and have a good night out with your girlfriends, that's fine, but do so responsibly is kind of what she's getting at here. Because at the end of the day, genetic predispositions, unfortunately, are what they are.
but I think we should be fortunate uh, that natural selection did not favor this particular type of strategy. Violence. Okay? And that's pretty much it for chapter two. So that, that's what she had to talk about. Basically highlighting the differences between men and women. And as a woman, knowing that information, what you can do to keep yourself safe um, in a world where these differences exist. Okay? Now... The third chapter that she has is called Some Desires Are Bad, right? Which naturally ties into what we have in the second chapter, right? You're seeing where she's going with this. And she begins the chapter by talking about the concept I've mentioned a few times now, sociosexuality, one's open-mindedness to casual sex and sexual variety, right? So the higher your sociosexuality, the more open you are to casual sex and sexual variety, and the lower your sociosexuality is, the less open you are to that. Logically, given the libido gap, it should be obvious that men have higher sociosexuality on average than women do on average. We'll talk more about that later. But in the context of a sexual market, this will naturally make men buyers and make women sellers. We've mentioned this in the Manosphere as well. The idea that women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers of commitment, right? Again, when you have a very transactional type market in 2022, this is naturally what happens as a result of a deregulated sexual marketplace. The reality is that men want casual sex more than women want it. So progress, as the sexual liberation movement would have you believe, it has trade-offs. And feminism leaves little room for nuance in this regard. They just tell you it's all good and they ignore the bad. Now, some would argue that just as, um, you know, there are low sociosexuality-oriented women to connect with the low sociosexuality-oriented men, the same is true for the high ends. But we just said men on average have higher sociosexuality, which means in a free market, in order to meet the demands, right, and fill in the gaps, there will be collateral damage, aka women who may not necessarily want to get pulled into this shit show. They have low sociosexuality, but they end up in situations with high sociosexuality men. Um, again, this is going to be the natural collateral damage of taking a more casual and accepting attitude towards sexual liberation. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, in other words. Okay? And that's pretty much um, the, the basis behind the sexual free market and how it can actually do some bad. Now, she cites an example of someone who is perceived to be on the wrong side of history by feminism, right? Even though she has actually done some good so Perry goes on to talk about Mary Whitehouse. So she spent 37 years campaigning against permissive society. And granted, within that, she did take up some issues with things that are much more accept acceptable now, such as same-sex relationships, for example, right? Which me personally, I take no issue with at all. You, you like who you like, I don't really give a shit. Me caring is like me caring what you order at the restaurant. I'm not eating the food. I don't care. But Mary Whitehouse did have a problem with this. But she also had a problem with sexual liberation. She had an issue with promiscuity. She had an issue with, for lack of a better term, mating strategies outside of the prevailing strategy. Right? Which would be something akin to high parental investment and family building. And if it wasn't monogamy, it was polygynous. One of those two. Okay, but unlike feminists, she did not want change, especially in the sociosexual sense. She didn't want women meeting the demand of high sociosexual men, right? She wanted men to have self control, restraint, and be okay with having one, right? And, um,. As I said, what she's, she wasn't looking for change. She was looking for what we would call stasis. She wanted things to stay the same. 
Now, she did have some paranoid preconceptions in some regards, and this is what history remembers her for. She's the person that didn't like same-sex relationships and stuff like this. But what they conveniently forget is that she relentlessly campaigned against child abuse. Right? And men such as Hugh Green and Jimmy Seville, who were crucifying White House, were also abusing women and kids behind closed doors, using the advancement of the permissive society to their advantage. So what's she trying to prove here, right? What exactly is she trying to say with this wrong side of history section? What she's trying to say is that, look, we have these men with high sociosexuality, right? They want to have lots of casual sex. And a lot of these guys are in positions of power, like Jimmy Seville and um, Hugh Green were. Now, the average man, obviously, is not in a position of power like that. But again, when you have a sexually liberated attitude, right, and you say that sex isn't a big deal, right, then all of a sudden you have guys like this who think it's okay to have a rap sheet of abusing a thousand plus women and children. Like nobody says anything. Yet in that same breath, they're going to crucify someone who tried to stop child abuse. So in the name of sexual liberation, you deem child abuse an acceptable casualty. That's kind of the picture she's trying to paint here. And obviously, that is not an acceptable casualty. That is uh, disgrazia of the highest order, for sure, in my opinion. And she goes on after that even further to talk about how in the 1970s they tried to normalize this type of stuff only for pushback to occur in the 1990s. White House lobbied to get the Protection of Children Act of 1978 passed. But you won't hear about that in a gender studies class. You'll get chronological snobbery instead. She's some old archaic fossil. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't know anything about sexual liberation. No, but she knows what's right and wrong. (laughs) She does know that, which I think is worth a hell of a lot more than sexual liberation, if you ask me. Now, continuing to build off of this, we have the concept of breaking taboos. Now, one of the downsides, as we just demonstrated with the whole, um, you know, trying to make, you know, this type of shit that Jimmy Savile and Hugh Green were getting up to more acceptable in the 70s, only for there to be pushback in the 90s. One of the downsides of sexual liberation is that it tended to be indiscriminate about taboos it sought to break. Freedom at all costs. This leads to things like MAP, minor attracted person. This is something you no doubt have heard of on, you know, mainstream social media, and it makes you cringe like a motherfucker, just as it makes me cringe like a motherfucker, because it's disgusting, in my opinion, and it's unacceptable. But you notice that this kind of shit is gaining traction on social media. And in my opinion, it has no right to do so. But when you push for a sexual liberation movement, unfortunately... When you try to talk of absolute sexual freedom where everybody can just do whatever they want, you eventually get people like this who try to hijack it, and it leads to a very, very dark place very quickly. Okay? And and in the eyes of the majority, they probably would agree with my take. That's like, nah, (laughs) no, that's got to stay taboo. Fuck you. But sexual liberalism, without any values to balance it out, inevitably leads to anything goes, basically. And look no further than that 2020 Netflix film, Cuties. Nothing cute about that. From what I understand, that was some ratchet-ass disgusting shit. And that had no business being on Netflix. You're trying to say that it brings awareness to the problem, yet you're parading it all over the fucking screen. That didn't, in my opinion, that didn't spread any awareness. That just enabled that 10% that we were talking about before. And those are the last batch of people you want to enable. Okay? And then the last part of this chapter, Some Desires Are Bad, is this idea of virtue of repression. Right? Sexual self-control. It's important. And in the manosphere, we call this de-discipline. Right? Jokingly, but you understand what we're saying. Not to be a fucking reckless jackass with your sexuality and not to do stupid shit or immoral shit. 
we already have a system of laws in place to enforce this. Which many would agree is not a bad thing. Of course. You assault someone, you go to jail. Makes sense. We can't have people like that walking around. They're a danger to society. Can't have that. Now, you can argue if you want to jump out of the book for a minute and say, well, they have no control of what they do because it's all genetically and um, predispos- predisposed and all this shit. And in combination with their environment, activating those genes, they are what they are, right? It doesn't change the fact that they're a danger. And if they're a danger, got to keep them away. Got to keep them away from people who could be seriously harmed and traumatized um, by them. It's just not good for society at large, in my opinion. Okay? Now, where this legal line is drawn, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, it varies from society to society. But the theme is the same. Sexual repression is a useful counterweight to sexual expression so that it doesn't go off the rails. As the saying goes, too much of something can be bad, even if it's a good thing, right? So you have to have expression and repression balance each other out within reason, a sexual ethics system. Not just a black and white. Either anything goes or it doesn't. Anything goes or you're a patriarchal oppressor. Like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Right? So, sexual liberalism. It pushes to disregard our moral inclination in favor of freedom. Consequences be damned. So when we say moral inclination, what do we mean? Surely you've heard the saying, if it doesn't seem right, if it doesn't feel right, there's a good chance it isn't. It's your gut instinct telling you something's fucked up here. This ain't right. Why deliberately go against that moral instinct? Why? In the name of freedom? Freedom for who? The 10%? Fuck those people. Now, she also believes that consent on its own doesn't have much of a leg to stand on, which leads to a lot of these gray area hashtag me too scenarios. Chivalry, in Perry's view, needs to return. And we'll talk more about this consent thing later on. All right? But that pretty much concludes chapter three. Some desires are bad. So after this, she wants to continue to drive the point home that sex isn't just this meaningless thing, right? It is special. And there should be some emotional value attached to it. And there certainly is for women. There can be for men. But men are able to separate it. We've seen this again and again and again because of this libido gap in higher sociosexuality. But the core of chapter four in the book is loveless sex is not empowering for women is what she's specifically honing in on because remember, she wrote this book primarily for women. So she begins this chapter by pointing to examples like The Fall, a 2010s show about a cop who is strong, independent, engages in casual sex and stuff like this, as well as Sex in the City to illustrate how media promotes meaningless sex as empowering women. It pushes the idea that you need to end the patriarchy. You need to go against your socio-sexual inclination, which is basically most women on average tend to be more low in socio-sexuality compared to their male counterparts. So they're more likely to want to have sex within the framework of a relationship, most of them. Not all of them, of course. There's always outliers, just as there are with men. But basically what the current sexual liberation narrative is saying is go against that. Throw that out. Throw out your ooga booga. Don't even think about that. Fuck these men back. (laughs) That's kind of the message being sent here, right? The sexual agency is more important. Psychological damage caused by that? Acceptable cost. Faking it till you make it, though, is just that. Faking it. And ultimately, it's going to leave you feeling empty. And I agree with this. I think if you're a woman listening, and deep down, you, you again, the idea of casual sex, it just doesn't sit right with you. It's probably because, for you, it isn't right. 
does that mean that every single woman on the face of the earth is should not be okay with casual sex? No, I'm not saying that. There definitely are women that are uh, more predisposed to engage in a more non-committal casual mating strategy. Of course, we talked about this when we talked about the last book. But generally speaking, it's probably not what you really want. You're probably looking for a committed relationship. And um, faking it in hopes that you get it eventually, it's it's not going to work. Okay? So the next thing in the chapter, again, is revisiting in more detail the sociosexuality, the libido gap, right? So sex has higher costs for women. We know this. If a woman has sex and she gets pregnant, that's nine months of her life. And she needs protection and she needs investment in that child to ensure survival. So saying that women ought to just forget about all that and fuck back even if they don't necessarily want to, makes it worse. Just because in modern times, right, 2022, social disapproval of casual sex has gone down, it doesn't mean one should just embrace it wholesale and open up the floodgates, right? Yes, sure, you can go and have casual sex, and yeah, most of mainstream society is not going to give you shit for it like they would have, say, 60 years ago. But it doesn't mean that you should, right? And in the book, she has a series of questions, and I want to ask these questions for you as well, um, so that you can really think about it. Um, because the author, what, what Perry questions is the claim that a culture of casual sex is somehow beneficial to you as women. So there is a standard questionnaire that researchers use to assess sociosexuality. So see how you respond to these questions and that probably could determine your sociosexuality, whether you're more high in sociosexuality, which means as a woman, you're more open to casual sex. You're more open to sexual variety. You're less prone to commit and invest in one, right? Um, the way you answer these questions will determine that demeanor, assuming you're not bullshitting yourself and assuming that everything you've done up until this point isn't just buying into some narrative and it's what you really wanted to do. And you would have done it anyway, even without this narrative, right? So here are the questions. Think about these questions, process them, reflect on them, and then decide what you want to do from there. The first question is, with how many different partners have you had sex with in the past 12 months? Don't tell anyone, keep it to yourself. We don't want to know. Second, with how many different partners have you had sexual intercourse on one and only one occasion? One night stands, the ultimate marker of non-committal sex. How many times have you done that? Third, with how many different partners have you had sexual intercourse without having an interest in long-term committed relationship with this person? You knew this person was not gonna be your boyfriend. You had no interest in this person being your boyfriend and you weren't secretly hoping that he would magically get the hots for you if you gave up the sex, right? You just legit wanted to go and do it, and that was it. How many times did you do that? Do you agree that sex without love is okay? Is love a necessary component for you to have sex? Perhaps more specifically, do you have to at least like the person? Can you imagine being comfortable and enjoying casual sex with different partners? Is that something that you could wrap your head around and be like, yeah, I think I would enjoy that. Do you only want to have sex with a person when you are sure that you will have a long-term serious relationship? This is asking in the opposite direction now. This is testing for low. Answer honestly. And lastly, how often do you have fantasies about having sex with someone you are not in a committed romantic relationship with? These are the types of questions that can help you outline what your general attitude towards sex is so you can figure out where the fuck you fit on this and also figure out if it's what you really want or if you got duped by a narrative, which is why these questions exist. So hopefully these questions shed some light and you learn something about yourself in answering these questions. Um... There are a couple more. <laughs> Sorry. How often do you experience sexual arousal when you are in contact with someone you are not in a committed romantic relationship with? Well, that's important, right? 
if you're not turned on, it's probably painful as hell. And in everyday life, how often do you have spontaneous fantasies about having sex with someone you have just met? Okay. So add those two questions on top. Okay. And really reflect on the answers as well. So that's pretty much it for the, um, the socio-sexuality gap. Yeah. The next section of our book is called A Hand Held in Daylight. So what does this section talk about? Well, men want casual sex more than women. This is no secret. That doesn't mean all men are interested in casual sex. For example, me personally, I have no interest in casual sex. But that might just be an anomaly on my part, right? Most men probably are, on some level, not shy about wanting casual sex. Women want commitment more than men. That's no secret too. We got no shortage of girls that are frustrated that they keep getting ghosted. We have no shortage of women that are frustrated that, um, you know, the idea of being in a relationship is not being brought up. And hookup culture, it benefits the men who get play, not the women. So again, who's winning in this hookup culture? It's the men who are having 80% of the sex, they're winning because they want casual sex and you're giving it to them. And in the process, you are making yourself not marketable for marriage at the same time. So at the end of the day, you're losing, you're screwing yourself deliberately. And why? In hopes that these men magically change their mind and commit? It doesn't help you. And I think that's the point that she's trying to make here. So again, those socio-sexuality questions, depending on how you answer those, either you are doing what is in line with what you really want to do or you're not. And if you're not, that should give you a moment of pause to really think about this. Nobody's perfect, you know. We all have errors in judgment. Human error is a natural part of the human condition. But if you're catching yourself, now's the time to take action on that, okay? But the idea of a hand held in daylight is this idea that women, they just want a guy that they could be with and quite literally hold their hand outside in broad daylight in public where people know that they're committed to each other. They don't want to just be some side chick that takes the walk of shame in the morning. If you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Building off that though, um, the author does say that unwanted sex is worse than sexual frustration. So putting pressure on women low in sociosexuality to meet the demands of men high in sociosexuality is unacceptable. So many helicopters today, man. Like, did someone rob a bank or is like the CIA landed on my roof? I don't fucking know, bro. But um, when you consider things like, uh, you know, pregnancy and violence as being very real risks when you're dealing with men, in a sexual situation, a one-on-one -on -one situation like that. You ha you can't afford to not be picky, is the point, all right? And instead of being responsible, being conscious of your own interests, trying to stay safe and things like this, instead you're encouraged to have sex the same way that men have sex. You're encouraged to fuck back. And it's a lose-lose. You don't win in this scenario. It doesn't work out for you. So that's definitely an important point to make. And here's just some other just stats that she has from some of the sources she cites in her book. In first-time hookups, women orgasm only 10% of the time. It's more like 70% in LTRs. So obviously, right, actually being deeply connected to the guy for a majority of women, plays a major, major role in her ability to enjoy sex. So the nature of the relationship with the man, it matters to women a great deal. And in another study, 30% reported pain in casual encounters, but did not say anything to the man. Why would anyone want to have crappy sex with a stranger? That's really the question that I have here. 
three out of every 10 are experiencing pain. Now granted, I am fairly certain that a lot of these sources that she's citing, interesting findings, probably not replicated sufficiently to have a conclusive um, yes or no answer on a lot of these things. But from the initial data, we seem to have this leaning towards the fact that women don't really enjoy casual sex as much as people in the manosphere seem to think women enjoy riding the CC. So the idea that is from where I sit is that if men could get duped, why can't women get duped? They do seem genuinely shocked when they don't get the outcomes they want after their CC writing is done. So hopefully there are people who are watching this that can be saved before they make these decisions. And that being said, the author does have a series of other questions for you to consider in light of these figures, right? If you're a woman who's had casual sexual relationships with men in the past, you might try answering the following questions as honestly as you can. Did you consider your virginity to be an embarrassing burden you wanted to be rid of? Do you ever feel disgusted when you think about consensual sexual experiences you've had in the past? Have you ever become emotionally attached to a casual sex partner and concealed this attachment from him? Have you ever done something sexually that you found painful or unpleasant and concealed this discomfort from your partner, either during or afterwards? If your score is zero, then congratulations. Your high sociosexuality and good luck have allowed you successfully to navigate a treacherous sexual marketplace. But if you answered yes to any of these questions, as the author suspects you probably did, you are entitled to feel angry at a sexual culture that set you up to fail. And the reality is, yes, it did set you up to fail. You bought into a narrative that ultimately is not conducive to your goals, which is probably you want to find the one someday, right? You want to find a guy that you could settle down with. But by engaging in this type of shit that it doesn't even seem you enjoy anyway, you're fucking up your chances. It's basically what you're doing. Right? And at the same time, right, she also talks about how a lot of men who are also engaged in this casual stuff might not be as happy about it as they claim they are either. So she asks a few questions for the men as well. The first question is, have you ever had sex with a woman you'd be embarrassed to introduce to your friends? Have you ever failed to contact a woman after sex? Have you ever suspected that your casual partner was becoming emotionally attached to you and failed either to commit to or break off the relationship, aka ghosted? And four, have you ever encouraged a woman to do something sexually even though she showed reluctance? Now, in an ideal world, if you are a man who has the mind for monogamy, the answer to all these questions ought to be no in the eyes of the author. But a culture of casual sex incentivizes men to do such things, and generally with no social penalty. It's true. The men who are having most of the sex, they're just kind of ghosting and pissing off these girls left and right, and really nobody's doing anything about it. It just sort of is what it is. And both the men and the women ultimately are going to end up empty-handed if their goal is to have a monogamous relationship someday. That is a fairly likely outcome. It's not guaranteed to be the outcome. Some people do things that are counterproductive to their goals and they still end up getting what they want anyway. And then there's people who do everything right and still get nothing. I'm not saying that those types of scenarios don't exist, but I'm saying if you want to decrease your odds of getting what you want, um, this is a good way to fuck things up for yourself. All right. The next section is cads and dads. So as we have seen, the non-replicable study of strategic pluralism, um, what women are attracted to isn't linked to her cycle. Women tend to want the same things in either a casual partner or a long-term partner. Basically, if she's horny, she just wants the things she already wants even more, right? 
if she's being honest with herself, you know, tall, handsome, humorous, exciting, and so on, these are probably like examples of traits that she's looking for. But men, on the other hand, have two distinct categories in their minds, and every man here knows what I'm talking about. Good time only and worthwhile. That is, women that a man will sleep with, and men are able to do this because they can separate sex from commitment and think nothing of it, and worthwhile, a, a woman that a man would strongly consider um, committing to for a long-term relationship. Now, men with low sociosexuality might not have good time only. They might just have worthwhile and not worthwhile, which is kind of how I operate. But the premise of having these two categories and why men have these two categories is wired in as a function of paternity certainty. You could have all the DNA tests in the world. It doesn't change the fact that men have a vested interest in paternity assurance when they decide to emotionally invest in a woman. But a cad is not really concerned about this. Which is why when he goes and just has casual sex with a woman, he doesn't really give a fuck. But a dad is concerned about this. And that's the point she's trying to make in cads and dads. And in the Manosphere, we talk about these two categories very often. And any woman who watches the Manosphere content knows that men, most men, are kind of somewhere in the middle on this socio-sexuality spectrum. And they have these two categories in their heads. Women that they'll just casually fuck around with and women that they'll seriously commit to. And depending on your own sociosexuality, that's going to have an impact on which category he puts you in. So if your goal is to be in the worthwhile category, then obviously being conscious of your own sociosexuality and how that relates to his will play a role. And that's what she drives at at this point. And the last section of this chapter is mutual incomprehension right? So mutual incomprehension. Um, what I've got here is that the oofy doofy of sexual liberation, because that's what it is, right? It is a socially constructed movement that um, opened the floodgates on a lot of things. And it leads some men and women to wrong conclusions. Outcomes that may not be best for what and in line with what they actually want. And they may not even fully grasp the very hookup culture that they're participating in which of course is troubling. So there's this mutual incomprehension here where men and women, they're engaging in this hookup culture. They've been influenced by the sexual liberation movement, but they don't fully understand how exactly they've been mind fucked. And that's pretty much it for the loveless sex is not empowering chapter. Now, the next chapter I found pretty interesting, right? Because in modern culture, in especially Western countries, we talk about consent, consent, consent. If everyone's consenting, everybody's agreeing, there's nothing wrong with it, blah, 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 right? Fair enough. But the author here, the campaigner who has a campaign that is called um, We Can't Consent to This, probably has a thing or two to say about consent so let's get into it so when she's talking about consent right she begins by painting a picture of a clear-cut case where a grooming gang in the uk took advantage of a vulnerable girl in the uk no consent is obvious it's a pretty grueling story that she outlines in the book if you want to read it yourself it's there but it's like clear-cut anyone who is not in that 10 percent and fucked up in the head would look at this and be like, yes, this is clearly disgrazia. It's wrong as fuck. It's totally wrong. No way. Right? But then she contrasts this with something a little less obvious, a little bit more gray. Casey Jordan, an adult film star. Despite the fact that, yes, she got into that field, um, and, you know, we would argue by the rules of the sexual liberation movement, she said, yes, I'd like to do this, blah, 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 blah. At the age of 22, she attempted self-deletion on a YouTube live stream, right? And since then, she has reflected much on how her lack of education on the industry itself, as well as her poverty at the time, it led her to this point, to join the industry. And at the time of her career, though, while she was in the industry, 
she insisted that she was consenting and was of legal age, right? And, you know, in the eyes of the law, you got to fucking put a line somewhere. You have to make the call and the call is 18. That's the line. But her attitude genuinely changed after she finally got out of the industry. She wasn't immersed in that anymore. A self-deletion attempt doesn't just fall out of the sky. And when you look at that, it's like, okay, so something, when she was in it, she felt she couldn't say that. Now, again, from a Manosphereian perspective, some might argue, oh, you know, that's just some chameleon bullshit. Uh, you know, she wants to have her cake and eat it too. She wants to she wants to fucking hop on a bunch of dicks, collect money, and then act like she found Jesus and blah, 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 blah. And now she wants a ring. But I don't think this is like a Mia Khalifa or Alana Rhodes type case. Um, this is clearly something else. Because I don't think someone who's trying to dupe people into marrying her would try to end herself at age 22. So this is clearly a different example. But she's going to offer an explanation here that I found pretty interesting. She goes on to talk about Stockholm Syndrome, as a lot of people do when they talk about intersex relations, and how women can be observed defending their abusers, refusing to testify against their abusers, or outright saying they consented to all the terrible things done to them. Researchers have hinted at war brides being an adaptive response in humanity's long and bloody history, and what we see are remnants of that now. So the question, again, is always going to become um, the idea that, hey, um, someone comes in, butchers your spouse, and then takes you into their tribe. If that were to happen today, again, would the adaptive response be eventually you develop attraction even to this person who did this? And it's possible definitely that there's remnants of that in the genetic code. I wouldn't be surprised especially when you talk about in the other book we reviewed um, the whole alpha infanticide model and things like this. It would not surprise me, but it's always the battle between, all right, is it primarily Ooga Booga? Is it primarily Oofy Doofy? Is it neck and neck? So on and so forth, right? But she extrapolates from this that the industry, the adult film industry, is an oofy doofy manifestation of this Stockholm syndrome. I call it oofy doofy because it is socially constructed, the film industry. She goes on to talk about Linda Lovelace and Vanessa Belmond, as well as Jenna Jameson, to illustrate the point of how women seem to reveal the truth when they are able to get away from their captors for good. So basically, what she does here is she likens the industry um, to a predator. A captor who lures these um, women in with sweet nothings, and some of them legitimately, that is what happens because they're broke, they're desperate, they have no other way to survive. And a lot of them also end up developing drug addictions and things like this. There are porn stars who have gone on the record saying that, and thus they have to keep doing porn to make the money to fuel their addictions. That's a vicious cycle. It's this idea where the industry just kind of becomes the new normal for you. And you find yourself so reliant on it that it you, you find yourself in a position where you're defending it. You're saying that you fully consent to it, despite the very degrading nature of it and so on and so forth, um, in some categories at least. And um, this is very similar to the idea of defending abusers. Testi refusing to testify against abusers and things like this. But then when they finally escape their captors and they've been separated from them long enough, the truth comes out, right? So I found that to be very interesting. And she, she does talk a little bit about MindGeek. So MindGeek is a, com is a technology company, big firm. Um, the owners are kind of hush-hush. You really can't find any information about them. But the point is that um, they were involved in some really shady shit. And um, the websites that they were responsible for, I think the hub was one of them. There was a lot of very um, non-consensual, inappropriate content on the hub that was being found. And she kind of goes into the whole story of it 
of how um, basically these people were exploited and things like this. And even when they were asked to take this information down um, and take these videos down, rather, they weren't until they were faced with lawsuits and things like this. So it kind of puts on this image that it's harmless, but it's really not. So if you want to read more about MindGeek, uh, feel free to do so. But she moves on to talk about this concept of limbic capitalism. So what does she mean? Well, she specifically hones in on pornography and how it takes advantage of our natural arousal responses to get us hooked on it like a drug. Target the part of the brain responsible for feeling and play on the stimuli, neurological exploitation for financial gain. It's a drug that's so potent and it overstimulates your dopamine receptors, it's designed to keep you hooked. And I can vouch for this personally. I've talked about it before. I have an addiction. And um, it's really not easy to kick. It's probably more difficult than even alcohol. Yeah. I'm, I was able to quit alcohol. I was able to cut back on video game playing. But um, this is the thing that I that I struggle with. It's, it's not easy. Because it's like one of the only th- constants that you've known since... Um, you know, you were a teenager. So it's obviously very different from being, you know, the victimized woman that got lured in and exploited. It's very different from that, but you are still psychologically imprisoned on the other side as the the so-called consumer. And this is just another thing that has resulted from the sexual liberation movement. When you don't put any repression you just unleash the floodgates for expression right and now those gates are open there's no way you're going to close those gates ever again for the general population but at the core technology dominates our lives and business interests are not above exploiting that for money they call it sex positive liberating and empowering But the truth is not so cut and dry, not so black and white. It's in full color and checkered. It harms the consumers as much as the workers. And Perry concludes that users have an obligation to stop. So basically, she's talking to the men here and telling them, hey, if you are watching it, just understand that indirectly you are contributing to this. And... um, through understanding that that should be motivation to stop. Unfortunately, that's not how drug addiction works, right? As someone who is, you know, an alcoholic, I can tell you that um, you ultimately have to find a reason for yourself to quit. And once you find that reason, you'll quit. But until you do, you probably won't. You're more likely to engage in cognitive dissonance and rationalization to justify the continuance of your addiction. And that's no different for porn. But I do empathize with the view that she is saying. And deep down, yeah, she's right. You probably are better off without it. There, You probably don't, I would say not probably, definitely, you don't need it. Humans got along just fine without it beforehand. And perhaps we would be less um, desensitized as well. And that's pretty much it for uh, chapter five when highlighting the industry, the adult film industry in particular. So the point is commentary on the idea of consent. These people say that they consent, but after the fact, they realize maybe not as much as they thought. Now, granted, if you want to talk about responsibility, right? Whether or not they take responsibility, I suppose it depends on your perspective. Me personally, I look at it like, hey, whatever events take place, there's outcomes attached to that, and you got to deal with that. I didn't say it was pretty, but it is what it is. Just as I know, as a guy who uses porn, realistically, I can't see myself having a stable relationship with a woman until I get rid of that. Period. I can't see any other way. I can't see those two things existing in my life 
simultaneously, successfully. Can't. Same here with these types of things, right? When you get into the industry, there are outcomes attached to that. Unfortunately, though, you have people getting into the industry and they don't understand the full gravity of the outcomes attached. And then you get these results, which is very, very unfortunate. So now we're going to move on to chapter six. So chapter six is violence is not love. Okay. And she begins this, this chapter by talking about Fifty Shades of Grey and how it tries to marry the ideas of BDSM with Christian Grey's commitment to Anastasia, as well as the controlling nature of Christian. Now, some women have it in their genes to be aroused by this stuff, even dormant, possibly. And all it takes to activate it is the right oofy doofy and time. Now, women care a great deal about commitment. By now, it should be absolutely no secret that they do. That is men's emotional loyalty, their parental investment. Given that pregnant women need protection, it makes sense, right? Now, some men, they show that to women in positive ways, right? They express affection. They give them gifts. They show kindness towards children. These are indicators that a man is capable of protecting, providing, uh, parentally investing, these types of things. But others show that they care in unhealthy ways through controlling an obsessive behavior, trying to control every little thing she does because he's so scared and insecure about the fact that maybe she might do something undesirable like step out of the relationship or something like this. Granted, women are just as capable of being controlling like this as well, and it's wrong there too. The point is it's not healthy. It's not conducive to a good relationship built on mutual trust and respect. Okay? So, despite this whole controlling BDSM thing, right, where most of us are kind of looking at that like that's fucking kind of a little out there, right? The perceived commitment is there. Yes, this person's controlling. Yes, this person has violent tendencies, but he's committed, right? And being willing to do anything for that can be dangerous, right? And it's important for the ladies to realize in the eyes of the author that jealousy and fidelity are not synonymous, right? A false equivalence can occur where the BDSM that you and your partner do together can be associated with the love that they have for you. And it's not about that. It's about power. So she talks about how feminist writers praise people like Marquis de Sade, a French aristocrat who preyed on destitute and desperate women for his own sadistic ends. Basically, he would say, hey, you know, oh, you're, you're poor, you're having trouble, come live with me. And then he would engage in BDSM activities with these women against their will, right? And in a sick twist of irony, women wish to reclaim the BDSM as their own when it's a rather nasty business to want to claim any stake in to begin with. But with the dark triad mystique comes many perils, and some women pay the ultimate price, which we'll talk more about later. But yes, not all BDSM episodes end with both parties coming out of it alive, if you understand what I am saying there. Okay. So then she goes on to talk about choking specifically because this seems to be one of the more common acts of aggression during sex between partners. So feminists try to argue consent is all you need for BDSM, right? And if you want to stop, just say stop. Now, to be honest with you, right, if you as a man or woman find yourself saying things, I want you to hurt me or I want you to humiliate me, my friend, you don't need BDSM. You need therapy. <laughs> there is some trauma and damage there that you need to go get unpacked and processed. And if it's not that, well, I don't know what to tell you. Now, there have been cases where women have died during a strangulation. And the men would use the consensual argument. And you get the idea the rough sex argument in the court of law. 
Your Honor, I didn't mean to kill her. We were just getting really into it. <laughs> and the judge is just sitting here like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> Men's Health even wrote an article about how to safely choke your partner. <laughs> there is no safe way to choke your partner, right? Risks include cardiac arrest, stroke, miscarriage, incontinence, basically shitting and pissing yourself, speech disorders, seizures, paralysis, and other brain injury. Right? But this should be common sense. You cut off oxygen to the brain, that's <laughs> problematic. How many stories we got of guys fucking asphyxiating themselves and you find themselves hanging by a belt with their dick in their hand? It happens. It happens. There's a reason you don't do shit like that. <laughs> oh, man. In short, how can you consent to this, right? You don't even fully understand like the implications of getting strangled, what exactly is happening, what the risks are, and all this stuff, right? How is the law supposed to deal with this? How are they supposed to interpret this? Sure, you can jump through cognitively dissonant hoops to justify the BDSM lifestyle. Of course you can. But do you think a court will buy it? Whether they will or won't, it doesn't change the fact that the rough sex defense to justify the dead body is cropping up everywhere. Just another price for absolute freedom. Does that sound like freedom to you? It doesn't to me. Not to mention the neck marks look the same on a consenting BDSM participant and an abuse victim. How do you even begin to unpack this? At what point do you have to draw the line and say, bruh, this goes against all moral intuition. Why? <laughs> but that's pretty much it for violence is not love. So you can kind of see, based on the Fifty Shades of Grey idea, that sometimes this BDSM type shit can be misconstrued as expression of love when it definitely is not that. That is not how you express love to another person. But sometimes especially when you have like that Stockholm Syndrome type mindset and you want to be close to somebody. Sometimes you feel like that's all you have to latch on to. And that's sad. That's tragic. Because it doesn't have to be that way. And I hope those people who have been on the receiving end of that, they get the help they need. Find someone to talk to. Figure it out. Learn to love themselves again. And then we move on to chapter 7. People are not products. So this really dives into the how relationships have become very transactional and the ultimate form of transactionality is prostitution. And that's kind of what this particular um, chapter talks about. So the chapter begins with the tale of Josephine Butler, who campaigned against makeshift brothels in India for the British Army. So for those of you who don't know, at one point India was part of the British Empire, the British Raj. And um, yeah, one of the things was that while the military bases were there, um, for the um, for the needs of the soldiers, um, it would be beneficial to set up these brothels. But obviously, if you have a bunch of women who are low in sociosexuality, they're probably not going to willingly be the girls at these brothels. So obviously, there were a lot of girls here who were not consenting, and it was essentially sex slavery. That's what it was, right? Okay. And feminists, in particular, crap on Josephine Butler because of her religious beliefs and motivations, the fact that she was very Christian, right? But in the end, she helped women who were otherwise forced to serve as prostitutes, helping the helpless. It's an inconvenient truth for the sexual liberation narrative. This woman took other women into her home and instead of acknowledging her good deeds, they say she perpetrated an image of helpless Indian womanhood. Like these women didn't need her help. They're strong and independent. Are you fucking kidding me? Chronological snobbery. Disgrazia. Hindsight's 2020, isn't it? You think you know what's best. Tell that to the women who were forced into sexual servitude. Tell them that they're sexually liberated and free. They are not. But she goes on to talk about the ancient dilemma and solution, right? 
there is an evolutionary mismatch between the sociosexuality of the two sexes. In the black pill space, we call this mismatch cell. It's involuntarily celibate due to evolutionary mismatches. The problem that naturally arises is a surplus of sexually frustrated men who want to have casual sex, but the option is just not available to them. So the solution in ancient times was to take women from the lower classes, the prostituted class, it was commonly referred to, to fill in this gap. Because polygyny was a thing back then. So you had high status males providing and investing paternally in multiple women, right? And building families with them. Now, in modern times, the solution is for women to have sex like men, right? And the logic for the sexual liberation movement is if everyone could just fuck who they want, don't worry, this problem will take care of itself. But because women have their preferences for who they are and are not attracted to, no, it doesn't trickle down. There are still sexually frustrated men, right? Ask an incel about trickle-down economics in the sexual marketplace. You will not find any. So feminists will tell you that resistance to this is entirely tied to social stigma. The only reason you would resist something like decriminalized um, prostitution is because of social stigma. Now, my personal opinion on it is this, right? If the state has a lid on it, again, where you're simultaneously making sure that it is voluntary on the part of the women and that there is no trafficking or anything like that going on, um, that definitely would be better than the current model where it's illegally happening. There's a lot of trafficking going on and people who, are, who want nothing to do with this are being forced into sexual servitude, right? But the point here that the feminists are trying to make is that social stigma is the only reason that it's not decriminalized? No. The reality is this, that sex is not meaningless. It is not a meaningless thing, right? For example, I'm sure ladies would agree, there is a difference between working overtime for your boss to get a promotion and giving your boss a blowjob to get a promotion, right? But if sex doesn't mean anything, those two things should be the same thing. Both of them accomplish the same objective, you get the promotion, do you not? No, they're not the same thing. Why? Because the second thing, it actually matters to you. It means something. It's your emotional investment. And you do not want to emotionally invest under a desk, do you? No. That's what we mean when we say this isn't just some meaningless thing. It means something. And this is why a majority of women are averse to prostitution in the first place. If they are going to turn to it, it's out of desperation, most likely. They're broke. They have no means to survive other than this. Right? So if they are averse to it, and most women are low in sociosexuality, and the number of women who are high in sociosexuality willing to engage in prostitution is limited, and you want to normalize the meeting of men's demands, which are much higher than women's in the sexual department, sooner or later the issue gets forced, which is a problem. Government regulation might be able to mitigate some of this, but it probably will not succeed in mitigating it um, completely. So at the end of the day, government regulated prostitution or the current model, which is complete unregulated black market prostitution, you're choosing the lesser of two evils, basically. But that doesn't mean it's good. Now, women in particular aren't really going to voluntarily do this for a simple reason, right? They're being denied the opportunity to choose their mates. In a prostitution model, you're having sex with men you're probably not even attracted to, that you don't even want in any way, shape, or form. And to me, honestly, this is no different than a girl who goes out and deliberately gets herself drunk so she can endure her one-night stand. Again, this doesn't sound like freedom to me. It just sounds like you're enslaved to a new master, which, of course, is not in your best interests. And this is why it feels so wrong to you, like your moral intuition tells you. But what's interesting is, despite the general attitude that liberals champion the plights of the poor and the downtrodden, it's interesting how the conversation gets flipped when talking about the sex industry. When talking about the sex industry, they tend to highlight those in the elite echelon, 
with positive things to say about sex work. And the definition of sex work is so damn broad that nobody knows kind of where the legitimacy begins and the bullshit ends and vice versa. Right? So you have many high-profile people. Sex workers who are not poor. They're highly educated. And they aren't in the business of doing this long term. A lot of these women who claim to be sex workers, really, they're more like sex tourists, right? These are people who try to dabble in the sex work, make a quick buck, and then they try to go off and get married afterwards. More on that later in terms of why that doesn't work. Like, I think you would agree, for example, that a cam girl who has clients on the side for $200 an hour in a first world country is not the same as a drug addicted prostitute in a third world country being trafficked by a pimp for $20 a session. Those two experiences are very, very different, right? And the second scenario is more common than you think. But you have people who are champions of sex work who are gonna highlight the first scenario and completely ignore the second one. Like there aren't any negative side effects to this type of shit. Which is why the author preaches something akin to sexual discipline. Restraint. These aren't bad things. Okay? But not everybody's going to agree with it, of course. But the next thing she talks about is called luxury beliefs. And I found this particular concept interesting. Luxury beliefs is this idea of detaching social status from material objects and attaching it to beliefs instead, right? Saying things like decriminalize sex work or sex work is works. It's a luxury belief. You have the luxury to believe that, right? In a first world country, you have certain luxuries. For example, a white girl in America with a PhD that makes money on the hub has no idea what a prostitute in the third world enduring, is enduring being part of a human trafficking ring or something like this. She has no clue what that's like, right? So she's afforded this luxury belief to believe these things that she believes about sex work and how it really works because she's not on the receiving end of the shitty side of it. She doesn't live the underbelly, right? It's like when feminists talk about how oppressed they are and then they completely ignore how women in the Eastern world are treated. They just completely ignore that because they know if they try to go and say some shit over there, bad things are going to happen to them, right? Same idea. You have a luxury belief to say the things that you say. And I'm not saying the, that the feminist movement, that this is unique to them, right? We have people all over, including in the manosphere, who, again, they say certain things. There are certain experiences they're not privy to. And as a result of that, there is an incomplete picture and that person would owe it to themselves to go speak to people who have experienced those pieces of the incomplete picture to get a better overall image right but if the scientific revolution disenchanted the world the sexual revolution disenchanted sex in the process of deregulating it quote aaron sabarium as we have set up until this point this idea of sexual disenfranchisement Sex isn't a big deal. Feminism insists this is good, but their behavior suggests that they still want something more. What are we talking about? We're talking about CC writers who come around and say, I just want someone to love me. That's what you wanted all along, but you bought into some bullshit. And now it's too late. And this author is trying to tell you, hey, turn this ship around before it is too late. Because once it's too late, that's it. The man is going to perceive sociosexual incompatibility. He wants something serious and he sees kind of, uh, you know, what you've done and where you've been. No good. So the feminist movement, they'll praise a woman who wishes to make money doing cam work. Right? But they'll chastise a man for agreeing to a rent for sex deal with a willing woman. Right? Right? So here's another inconsistency. They support laws that would prevent a landlord from executing such an arrangement. But in that same breath, say that just because you've been in sex work doesn't mean you've experienced sexual violence. We just talked about the porn industry, and we just talked about prostitution and human trafficking. 
What are you talking about? Clearly, there are people that are traumatized from being exposed to this type of shit. Because women are low in sociosexuality. So thrusting them into this casual environment to meet the needs of men with higher sociosexuality, it can have a traumatic effect. Yeah, some girls come out of it okay. But then you got women who try to self-delete on a live stream on YouTube. At some point, you got to look at this and say, all right, something's kind of fucked up here. Right? So there's no consistency. When the woman wants to make an OnlyFans, okay, you're fine with it. But all of a sudden, sex work isn't work anymore when the chick wants to give that in exchange for rent because she doesn't have the money. Right? And if, and if you're thinking about this like, hey, one of these things is wrong, right? Then maybe we're wrong. We're wrong about the attitudes of sexual liberation and maybe we need to rethink this shit, which again is the point of this book. So why discriminate, you know, against sex for rent, but not sex for money, right? Perhaps because it could potentially affect those with luxury beliefs, right? It's no secret that the economy is kind of on the downturn. So maybe it'll be some of these middle class girls that had the luxury beliefs that are now doing this stuff for rent. A little bit easier to not think about the negative blowback, right? When it's some third world country filled with third world women that you're not thinking about. But when it's your daughter who's struggling to pay the rent that might be doing that, ooh, all of a sudden it gets uncomfortable. Get laws passed to protect your daughter. But that girl on the street that you don't know from a hole in the wall, yeah, fuck that, right? A far cry from that woman who was taking them into her home, trying to help them find a better life. That same woman that's ridiculed and viewed as an enemy of feminism when what she did helped women get out of really bad situations. It's ass backwards, bro. This oofy doofy shit is ass backwards. There was also an economist by the name of Robin Hansen. He argued that men with low access to sex despite wanting it could suffer to a similar degree as those with low income, right? And he said, okay, well, if we're in a sexually liberated society and sex doesn't matter, right? Doesn't mean anything. Then perhaps these men, it makes sense for them to rally for the idea of lobbying for redistribution of sex, just as the compensation for said sex could be financially redistributed, right? But all of a sudden, feminism does a 180 and swiftly reacted and said, women are not commodities that incels are entitled to, right? These are the same women that are saying, hey, sex is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything, but you won't fuck the incel. Why? Oh, I see. When it's in your backyard and it's you who's told like, hey, just accept the money for it, right? It's just sex, right? It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. That's why you give a fuck. That's why you react with such hostility towards people that you don't find attractive which is unfortunate for these guys. It's not their fault that their genes are what they are. But it illustrates the hypocrisy. It illustrates the cognitive dissonance you have to engage in to reconcile these two ideas. The fact that you do not want to be robbed of your agency to select mates, but at the same time, you want to act like mate selection and the way in which it is executed, aka sex, is not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so as i said it's interesting when it's the girl with luxury belief you've got something to say but when it's the poor drug addicted prostitute you are silent right you're silent about it you got nothing to say which tells me that maybe you don't even give a shit about women's problems you give a shit about your problems or the problems that you perceive. Oh, you individually are not sexually free enough. So if you individually can have your sexual freedom, okay, it's okay that a lot of these girls who are more susceptible to social influence 
make a bunch of mistakes that fuck them out of their ability to get a marriage later. It's okay that these prostitutes get dragged off the streets because they're desperate and broke and now they're getting sold into sexual slavery. Yeah, all that's okay so that you, your luxury belief can have your freedom. You don't see the ripple effect. You don't see the ripple effect. And sure, granted, men in the manosphere are also looking at it and saying, maybe operating from a strictly selfish position as well, in the sense that they only care about how women engaging in this type of hookup culture can affect their ability to secure a wife later on. Sure, maybe they're only thinking about it from that perspective, but at least we try to acknowledge that, yes, these fucked up things do happen, and it's the collateral damage of the sexual liberation movement. Dangerous stuff where real people are getting hurt. So, she goes on after this to talk about the cultural death grip syndrome. So what does she mean by this? Well, the death grip, right, it's this idea that porn and excessive fapping can have a negative impact on sexual performance and dopamine receptors, as well as desensitize you physically to sex, the real thing, right? It does this for some men, not all men, but it's enough that it's noteworthy. But Perry wants to take it a step further and say that there's a cultural desensitization, which we've talked about on this as well with social media and the like, a death grip, culturally, if you will. She cites things like Cardi B's WAP, which is wet ass pussy, highlighting the degradation of relationships and how they've gone from relational to transactional. It plays right into the hands of men high in sociosexuality, and it's a moneymaker. Guys like me who are low in sociosexuality, we value monogamy and things like this. It ain't us that's winning. We're losing. And so are you. Because deep down, it's you who wants monogamy as well. A lot of you. The women that are high in sociosexuality, all right, fair enough. But even Cardi B, she's in a serious, committed relationship. Yet she makes songs that betray her very lifestyle. Just for money. So really, it makes you wonder. Right? It makes you wonder what exactly you've agreed to and if it's actually in your best interest to live life like this as a woman. And lastly, she talks about OnlyFans and specifically hones in on how only 1% of the girls are making 33% of all the money. Basically, it's more unequal than South Africa, the most unequal country on the planet. Most are losing money. And to boot, it fucks up your chances at getting a ring later on, getting an LTR even. Because remember, men in their heads have two categories, generally. For a good time and worthwhile. So when you keep getting ghosted and you're posting a TikTok about how nobody ever calls you back, this is why. Because sometimes it doesn't even have to be high sociosexuality in the sense that you actually engage in lots of casual sex. It's just perceived high sociosexuality. If a man is lower in sociosexuality and he's serious about commitment, you're a bad bet. You're a bad bet. There's going to be an incompatibility there and it's going to cause a fucking problem. And men and women alike, they don't want problems in relationships. They want to keep that at a minimum. They don't want to make that shit like, you know, more troublesome than it needs to be. There's challenges in every relationship, but you don't needlessly create a bunch of challenges out of thin air if you can avoid them. Which is why sociosexual compatibility and understanding what your own is relative to others is important. And to be mindful of that when you go out and live your life. And that's pretty much it for the people are not products and how the culture has degraded relationships from relational where people were actually seen as people, and now it's more as products, unfortunately. And the last chapter that she has is marriage is good. So she is a proponent of marriage, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So she logically concludes that taking commitment seriously is a better alternative than acquiescing to sexual liberation. That brings misery and loneliness, and that it makes life hellish to trek through. No shortage of single women in their 30s that are miserable. Doesn't have to be that way. Doesn't have to be that way. Stop purchasing this product called sexual liberation narrative. Be honest with yourself about what you really want. Take something like no-fault divorce, right? 
fair enough. It really helped unhappy women at the tail end who were in abusive marriages. Right? No doubt about it. But the meat of the bell curve, the unintended side effect, is that average couples are divorcing just because... The fuck is that? Oh my god, this marriage got a little hard. I don't love you anymore. Bye. The fuck? What is that? Problematic. But again, when you pass this legislation, maybe you have good intentions, but the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And as a result, despite the fact that the author is a huge proponent of marriage, I still think there's no point in signing the contract especially if you do not want kids. If you don't want kids, LTR is sufficient. You don't have to get married. There's no reason to bring the government in on anything. Keep them out. I still retain that stance. And I don't think I'll ever be convinced otherwise. But she begins with this idea of my money, my choice. And she references Dave Chappelle's Netflix special, right? And she goes on to talk about the pill and abortion. This opened up a lot of avenues for premarital sex because the risk of nine months is its not really there anymore. I think if you use the pill regularly, it's like 91% effective. So that means like nine out of every 100, you might get pregnant. It's not perfect, but it's better. Um, but it also gave men more inclined to be pushy about sex, more cause to be. Well, you're on birth control. Well, you could just get an abortion. So come on, let's fuck. Now, obviously, in my view, no man should be coercing anyone to have sex. Should not be forcing the issue, right? If somebody says no, you fuck off. And if she's the kind of person like, no, I like to play hard to get. Motherfucker, you don't need dick. You need therapy. <laughs> Send that girl to therapy. Because if she's playing hard to get with shit like that where you can't afford to be like that, motherfucker, get out. <laughs> you need help. You need to love yourself, girl. <laughs> But feminists often say the ultimate slap in the face to patriarchy is to reject motherhood in marriage. You're basically your biological imperative to bond and have a family unit, right? Abandon that altogether in favor of other goals and aspirations. And she highlights this feminist called Shulamith Firestone, who was a huge proponent of this view. Basically, if women cannot participate in reproduction the same way that men can, non-committally basically, then don't participate at all was kind of her view. And for a time as she got older, she had friends who took care of her, but blood is thicker than water, isn't it? Eventually all her friends abandoned her and she died alone at home at the age of 67. And the coroner reports that it's likely she died of starvation. When you reject your inclination to have commitment, to build a life with someone and have all these things, this could very much be a real outcome for you as a woman. And to be honest with you, while men probably could survive on their own, probably, I think there are a lot of men that do like the idea as well of having, having a female companion. But given the degradation of relationships and people being seen as products and all this shit we've talked about up until this point with this sexual liberation movement, a lot of people are looking at it like, whatever used to be, it's dead. It's gone. And a lot fear that it's never coming back. It's impossible to bring it back. They really believe this. And perhaps they're right. But I hope they're wrong. Now, feminists have proposed ideas like communal upbringing for kids. The idea that like groups of people raise groups of kids together. But this minimizes the bond with kids. And obviously, kids who are not bonded with their parents, that's a really bad experience. We've seen what happens when kids don't have fathers and mothers around and shit like this. Never works long term. You can't just throw kids in childcare as a baby and hope for the best. Marriage has been proven to be the best model for raising kids. I can vouch for that personally, given my upbringing. Yes. And then she goes on to talk about the faithless soldier. Marriage was about reproduction and pooling resources, right? So that's changed because I always say this, women have their own LMS. So now it's more about sexual and emotional fulfillment. Growing up in a world with the pill, right? It's easy for a woman to sometimes forget what it would be like without that safety net. <laughs> but single motherhood is enough of a prevalent phenomenon in 2022 that it's there to remind women what it's like. 
So the purpose of this Faithless Soldier excerpt, right, is that casual sex, just reckless, it could lead to bad outcomes that you may not ideally want. And you could argue, well, abortion's your backup, and that's a whole other fucking can of worms. I've given my opinion on that. But the point is, um, commitment matters, and you shouldn't act like it doesn't. Just as men value loyalty as well when they are emotionally invested. So whether we're talking monogamous or less so polygynous marriages, both are preferable to out of wedlock abandonment. We can agree on this, surely. That alternative mating strategy where fast life abandonment over slow life parental investment in either one or multiple. And in particular though, through enforced monogamy, which came a little bit later, um, that in combination with the fact that most men could probably only provide for one realistically, um, it's proven to be a very successful model for raising kids. Lower child abuse rates, lower domestic violence, lower crime rates, and the presence of a father. It plays a huge role in cultivating children that are going to have better quality of life, better outcomes, right? So the logical conclusion at the end for her is that marriage is a, um, is a good call. However, when we look at the stats, I still say that an LTR isn't necessarily the worst thing. But don't be a fucking idiot about it. Men and women alike, pay attention to these things. We've probably talked to men on this channel and in this space to the point of nausea on red flags to watch out for and things like this, right? But she kind of gives some concluding thoughts in the final like epilogue concluding chapter of her book. Some tips, some things you should watch out for, ladies. And I thought that these were pretty succinct to the point, and therefore I'm going to share them with you. The first thing she says is simple. Distrust people uh, and ideologies that contradict your moral intuition. If something doesn't feel right, it's probably because it isn't. So if someone's trying to sell you an idea, right? Or someone's trying to convince you to do something that doesn't quite feel right, it's because it probably isn't right for you. So don't buy into it so readily the next time you're sitting in a gender studies class. If something feels off, it probably is. Second, chivalry is good. Sexual discipline is good. This idea, not just chivalry from the male sense, but chivalry from the female sense as well, in the sense that there's this mutual respect, mutual trust, effort to build goodwill, effort to connect. These things just logically make sense. They're good things to have. And a lot of that, when you take all the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know the word I'm looking for. I don't know lost it. I guess I'm going to have to say it in a more wordy way. When you take the things that make relationships special and make sex special, when you take those things out of the relationship and sex and you reduce it to a transaction, this type of stuff is lost. It's all expression, all freedom without accounting for the consequences and the cost. So what we're trying to say is, hey, if you're low in sociosexuality, look for people that are also low in sociosexuality. They respect your boundaries, and in return, they expect you to respect their boundaries. No means no. You get the idea. Three, red flags. Impulsive, promiscuous, overly disagreeable, and hypermasculine to the point where they're aggressive, not assertive, aggressive. It's okay to have boundaries and assert those boundaries, but being aggressive and prone to violence, not so much. Dangerous. You want to avoid that, right? And these are prob this is probably something we would tell men too. Like, don't be with women that are impulsive, they're promiscuous, they disagree with you at every fucking turn or are combative and they're hyper-masculine. Same idea. Relationships are a, are a joint project. So having no sense of agreeableness, not good. That applies to both sexes. Number four, more kind of, kind of a joke, but not really. Take it seriously. If he can maintain an erection while being violent, you should probably steer clear. Again, that BDSM shit, it'll probably set off some moral intuition in your head like, eh, okay, 
Get the fuck out of there. Number five, avoid being alone with men you don't know or you don't feel safe around. Do not ignore instinct. We tell men this all the time. It's important that a woman feels safe and comfortable around you. Women, from your perspective, it's important that you feel comfortable and safe. Do not go alone to places with men who which you do not feel comfortable and safe with. Because, while not guaranteed, it could lead to a bad outcome. And that's probably not a gamble you want to take. So keep your wits about you and your head on a swivel. Number six, if you plan to get drunk and high, do so in private with female friends is probably the safest way to avoid being in a vulnerable position. Just kind of common sense, right? Because when you're inebriated, you're very vulnerable. Now, don't use dating apps. Your circle can hold you accountable, an app can't. What does this mean? It means that, hey, if you use an app and engage in very morally bankrupt behavior or behavior that kind of goes against your moral intuition, you don't have friends, you don't have a support system, you don't have any peers that can hold you accountable and tell you that you're fucking up. And sometimes you get so deep in the rabbit hole, there's no turning back. And now you've basically put a roadblock between you and what you actually want in life, a meaningful, committed relationship. So obviously, if that's what you're looking for, dating apps is probably not where you're going to find it. Does that mean it's impossible to find it on a dating app? Of course not. But generally speaking, you already know what time it is. More so for men, for sure, but still applicable to women, still relevant. Number eight. Don't have sex until you are ready. Good way to vet which men are serious. This is true. Again, this is about that tension thing, right? Don't make me wait. Wait. Don't make me wait. Wait. He wants the sex. She wants the commitment, right? Well, the best way to make sure if he's actually fucking serious is, again, to not give up the sex unless you genuinely want to. There are people that they, they fell in love and, you know, they'll they'll fuck right away and that's fine but the point is don't do it because you feel obligated to do it do it because you want to do it same with men don't commit because you feel obligated to do it do it because you want to same idea just makes sense right number nine only have sex with men you would be you think would be a good dad that is, don't emotionally invest in men that you can't at least, even if like you don't plan on having kids. Like, can you look at this guy and say, yeah, this guy could be the father of my kids. Like, I could see him as that. That's just a good rule to go by, right? Because that implies that there's some sort of trust, there's goodwill, there's comfort and safety. These are important things. So don't get with a guy that fucking doesn't exhibit these things. Don't fucking get yourself drunk so you can grin and bear it and have a casual encounter that you're not going to remember the next morning. And one of you's taking the walk of shame. No, no good. Same thing with men, right? What, we, what do we say to men? Don't commit to a woman that you can't imagine her being the mother of your children. Common sense type shit. Okay, so that's number nine. And then the last thing, monogamous marriage is the most stable model to build a family. That's true. That's true. And even men in the manosphere say, look, if you're gonna get married, like, you gotta, like, have a family. That, that would be a reason, because obviously it's proven to be a stable model okay and that's pretty much it so hopefully this book gave you a lot to think about it definitely gave me a lot to think about um a lot of this definitely unlike the other book which really kind of targeted the ooga booga stuff this was more about oofy doofy like the big sexual revolution and how that impacted our behaviors and so on and so forth and how we were affected by it and how we thought we were supposed to behave based on what this narrative told us, it's not really conducive to the goals that we want and that the costs of implementing this wholesale, removing all taboos, having no repression to balance out this expression as a counterweight, the negative consequences of that. And sadly, I don't think there's a way to really reverse these things, only mitigate them. But as you can see by her recommendations here, there is a way that you as a woman can operate in a way where you have a clear conscience, you're not opposing your moral intuition, and you are in line with the goals that you want, which is to have a committed relationship with someone that you trust, you feel safe with, you're comfortable with, you respect, you admire, you desire, etc. Okay? So in that regard, I think this book is very useful. 
I recommend you do read it. Like I said, it's probably a woman's way to kind of get into this mindset. It's a good starting point. So good book. Um, I think that's all I really have to say about it. Um, otherwise, I risk repeating what I've already covered, and we've gone two hours already. So feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike. Call me an asshole, whatever you do. Don't report the video. It's good information. Help somebody. And um, if you like what you're hearing, hit that sub button. If you don't, you can unsub. As long as you get your information somewhere, that's fine with me. I also want to take the opportunity to make you aware that YouTube may be unsubbing you against your will. They might just be doing it. I was notified of that. One of my subscribers told me flat out, he was like, yo, I noticed I was unsubbed. I didn't click unsub. They just fucking unsubbed me. That's been happening a lot lately where I'll post a video and then like within 12 hours of it posting, like 10 subscribers will be gone. Granted, some of them could be bots. I have no fucking idea. But I'm just telling you in case um, you actually do want to remain subbed, um, but you're not. But hey, if it's if it legit is just 10 people that were like, wow, Pete, you're a little bitch. I don't agree with you anymore. I'm out. Then okay, that's fine. But if you are unsubbed, I want to make sure you're unsubbed because you actually want to be unsubbed. Not because YouTube just thought like, hey, I don't like you watching this shit. Unsub. <laughs> but yes, the whole point of this channel at its core, again, is to help men. But obviously with this video, you can see I'm trying to help the ladies out too by diving into this stuff. Avoiding self-deletion. That, that's what it is. Um, not getting so deep in that nihilistic valley where you feel this is the only way out. That's not a road I want you to go down. That's not a logical conclusion I want you to reach. I ideally would like you to see other options. And beyond that, giving the comprehensive library as many perspectives as I can find. Challenge my perspectives as much as I can as well. Because at the end of the day, I am in the business of seeking truth, not confirmation bias. Confirmation bias doesn't help anyone. It just reinforces our prejudices that ultimately hold us back, which obviously is not good. And ladies, as always, if you're learning something useful, great. Hopefully this stuff helps you, especially with this video in particular. Um, and if not, that's fine too. You're, you're entitled to think what you want. Um, at the end of the day, it's your life. Your outcomes are your own. I have no bearing on them. It's, it all rests with you. So it is what it is. Hopefully y'all all enjoyed the content. As always, I am that guy, Pete, that you refuse to invite to gatherings. I will catch you for the next one. Hopefully less reading and talking and just more to the point. But yeah, until then, I'll see you around. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.